Hey everyone, and welcome to another video here at Whiteboard Doctor. Thanks for joining us today. Quick disclaimer before we move on, none of these videos are intended to be acted upon as medical advice. Please pause the video here and read the disclaimer in its entirety before moving on. Channel plug, here at Whiteboard Doctor, our mission is to bring you interesting, relevant, and understandable medical education for all types of lifelong learners, trainees, and practitioners. If you want to follow along, we do have a lovely subscribe button in the bottom right-hand corner of all the videos. Don't forget to hit that like button. And lastly, if you'd like to support us outside of viewing our videos, we have several ways in which you can do that linked in the video description and pinned comment. Stay well, keep learning, and back to the video. All right, welcome everybody. Buddy, in this video, we are going to be talking about ECMO, or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Now, depending on when you view this video, it was actually recorded during the COVID-19 pandemic when, as a channel, we were coming out with a lot of COVID-19 related content. Now, ECMO is relevant to COVID-19 because actually severe end-stage acute respiratory distress syndrome from COVID-19 some of those patients have been placed on ECMO. But in today's video, we're going to be discussing ECMO in general. So it's gonna be an introduction to the principles of ECMO. We're gonna talk about what ECMO is, how it works, some different types of ECMO, including venous venous and venous arterial ECMO, the different parts of the ECMO circuit. So the machine, how the machine functions, what are the parts of the machine, what can you manipulate to optimize the ECMO circuit, we'd call it. We're going to then talk about indications to put a patient on ECMO, contraindications to putting them on ECMO and why, and then complications, because unfortunately with ECMO there are a number of really, really severe complications. And we're going to use some pictures and diagrams and stuff to go over this. So to start with the general principle of ECMO, ECMO in general is a therapy for when the lungs and or the heart are simply not working. So you're not able to oxygenate your blood or get rid of carbon dioxide, or the heart is unable to pump enough to provide enough blood flow to the organs. So what you do is you hook the patient up to ECMO, which is essentially a machine, and you pull blood out of the body put oxygen into that blood and take carbon dioxide out of that blood and then pump that blood back into the body. And we put here, seems straightforward, right? You know, it's just a circuit. You take blood out, you oxygenate it, take carbon dioxide, and then you pump it back in. But unfortunately, it is tremendously complex and wrought with, you know, complications. Make no mistake, this is a therapy for patients that have absolutely no other option. Patients that are going to, you know, die without something more significant such as ECMO to support them while their body heals. This is not a definitive therapy, meaning it's not for someone that has no potential to heal. This is a, you know, intervention that is meant to temporize and keep someone alive while their lungs and or heart heal enough to then maintain on their own without the ECMO circuit. All right, so what are kind of the two main different types of ECMO? Well, there's venous venous ECMO, also known as VV ECMO, and there's veno arterial ECMO, also known as VA ECMO, and we're going to get into why they're called these two different things and how they differ. Let's start over here with venous venous. So in venous venous ECMO, the idea is you're taking blood out of the IVC. The IVC is the inferior vena cava, or the right atrium, the RA. And then you're returning it back to the right atrial circulation. This is, oh, let us mute our computer, apologies. This is primarily for respiratory failure. So let's go into a diagram to better understand this. So here is the body, right? We have an arm here. We have an arm here. We have the two legs, right? Leg here, leg here. And what we're seeing is the circulation. So this blue tube here is the inferior vena cava. This red tube here is the aorta. We're using these two different colors to uh, decipher what is a vein and what is an artery. So the blue are veins, and the red are then arteries, okay? So what we have down here, when the aorta branches, or the two branches going in the IVC, what we have are the femoral vessels. 
So we have femoral arteries and veins, right? And in the red, you have the artery, and in the blue, you have the vein. So in venous venous ECMO, you're taking blood from a vein and putting it back into another vein, hence venous venous. So what you're doing often is you're pulling blood out of one femoral vein, right? So you're this is the cannula. This is a huge, you know, think of it as a large needle that's suctioning blood out of this vein. So the blood comes out of this femoral vein and then into the ECMO circuit, right? And it's deoxygenated blood. So it's blood that, you know, has traveled through the body already and was on its way back to the heart to get pumped into the lungs and get oxygenated. So it's deoxygenated blood. It then goes through the ECMO circuit, it gets oxygenated, and then it gets, so now it's red, right, because it's oxygenated, and it gets pumped back into the femoral vein at this point for venous venous, right, because it's going from one vein to another vein. It gets pumped back into the femoral vein, up into the IVC, and it's delivered to the right atrium of the heart. And then that blood goes from the right atrium to the right ventricle and gets pumped out into the lungs. The lungs then bring that blood back to the left side of the heart where that oxygenated blood is pumped into the circulation through the aorta into the you know arteries and delivers oxygen to the body. So venous venous ECMO, right, is for respiratory failure primarily. Why does that make sense? Well, what we're doing is we are delivering blood to the right side of the heart. We are not bypassing the heart in general because that blood on the right side of the heart has to get pumped to the lungs, then back to the left side of the heart, which then pumps that blood to the body. So all we are doing is oxygenating that blood. The heart is doing work just fine. It's pumping that oxygenated blood throughout the body. It's the lungs that are not functioning. So we are delivering oxygenated blood to the right side of the heart. So typically what we would see, right, is that the right side of the heart has deoxygenated blue blood. But in ECMO's case, VV ECMO's case, you're delivering oxygenated blood to the right side of the heart. That blood then does get pumped through the lungs, but the lungs aren't working. So the lungs don't contribute too much. And then that blood returns to the left side of the heart and is pumped to the body. So what you can think here is, you know, this cannula that is delivering, right, we scroll back down, right, we're pulling blood out of the femoral vein, it's getting oxygenated in the ECMO circuit, it's getting pumped back into the other femoral vein, into the IVC to the right side of the heart. This blood is actually oxygenated after it comes back out of the ECMO cannula to the right side of the heart. Does that make sense? So I don't want to belabor the point, but if we just draw, you know, a heart here, you know, I'm not an artiste, but what we have is right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. And as we know, deoxygenated blood from the body comes to the right atrium, goes into the right ventricle, then gets pumped from the right ventricle out into the lungs, which will, you know, say, look like this. The lungs then oxygenate that blood and pump it back to the left atrium, which that oxygenated blood goes into the left ventricle, and then the left ventricle pumps it out to the body. So with the VV ECMO circuit, what we are doing is what is typically deoxygenated blood, you know, we'll do DO here, on the right side of the heart is actually oxygenated blood because the ECMO circuit is delivering oxygenated blood to the right atrium which is then being pumped through the lungs, back to the left side, back to the body. All right. If that doesn't make sense, let us know in the question. Uh, let us know in the comments, and we can, you know, discuss it further. Um, and we usually use, as we talked about, uh, the femoral veins on both sides. But you could use the jugular vein, which is a vein in the neck that also travels down to the heart. All right. So that's VV ECMO, venous venous ECMO. It's meant as a uh, surrogate for respiratory failure when the lungs aren't working, such as in acute respiratory distress syndrome, which just for a timely correlate, COVID-19, we've seen a lot of really severe acute respiratory distress syndrome. Veno-arterial ECMO, or VA ECMO, also takes blood from the inferior vena cava, or the right atrium, but instead of returning it to the femoral vein, it returns it to the femoral artery. And this bypasses both the heart and of the lung function, 
And its primary role beyond that of respiratory support is actually for hemodynamic failure or, you know, cardiac failure. If your heart is not pumping, the ECMO circuit will take the blood oxygenated and pump it back in. Unlike for VV ECMO, where you're going vein to vein, in VA ECMO, you're going vein to artery, right? So you often are taking it from the femoral vein and pumping it into the femoral artery. So if we go back down to our picture, if we look over here, right, one cannula from vein and then the other cannula into vein. Here, though, we're taking it from the femoral vein, sucking this deoxygenated blood out. It gets oxygenated in the ECMO circuit, and it gets pumped back into the femoral artery, right, red instead of vein. And this then goes into the retrograde flow back to the heart, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a second. But what you can see is that VA ECMO is appropriately labeled because it goes from vein to artery, whereas VV ECMO goes from vein to vein. And if you think about going from vein to artery, what you are doing is you're essentially bypassing the heart because you're taking blood out of this vein and then you're pumping that oxygenated blood into the aorta to then be distributed to the whole body. And the heart function itself is you know, there's a lot of caveats here. The heart function itself is very important, even in VA ECMO, but the heart function itself in general is less important because you're giving the aorta, which is the big blood vessel that delivers blood to the whole body, oxygenated blood and bypassing the heart. All right, does that make sense? Again, let us know if it doesn't in the comments and we can go over it in more detail and answer your questions. So what is the ECMO circuit itself? What makes it up? What does it need to function? Well, if you think about its roles, you need a pump to pump the blood, a gas exchanger to take the carbon dioxide out and put the uh, take the carbon dioxide out and put the oxygen in, and then you need to keep it warm. So it is a simplistic conceptual setup, but it's tremendously complex at its roots. So the first portion is you have a centrifugal pump centrifugal meaning that the pump spins and the spinning creates a vortex that pulls blood in and then pumps the blood out and as you know a vortex right it's spinning it's measured and set at rpms rpms being revolutions per minute and that makes sense right when you think about rpms you know in cars or really anything circular that spins revolutions per minute and those revolutions per minute equate to the liters per minute of blood that is going to be pumped through the ECMO circuit back into the body. So if you have higher revolutions per minute, the pump is spinning faster, you're going to deliver a higher amount of blood back to the body. So you have higher liters per minute of blood delivered. The challenge with that is that this vortex that's sucking blood in and spinning in a circle actually shears red blood cells and leads to hemolysis. So the higher the RPMs, the better flow, but also the more hemolysis you get. All right, ECMO circuits, there's some variability, but they typically can deliver anywhere from, you know, one to six liters per minute. The co um, contrary to, you know, increasing the liters per minute with increased hemolysis, if you decrease the RPMs too low, which leads to too low of liters per minute blood flow, we're just going to move past that, you actually are going to get an increase in blood clotting because that blood will be too stagnant in the ECMO circuit itself. So what you want to do is titrate your RPMs to the appropriate liters per minute depending on the you know, pathophysiologic problem with the caveat being higher RPMs are going to have more hemolysis and lower RPMs are going to increase your risk for blood clotting in the ECMO circuit, which we'll go into more detail in in a little bit. Okay, there's also, you know, we didn't put this in here, but there's also what would be called a roller pump. The roller pump is just meant to compress the tubing, right? There's tubing that connects to the actual centrifugal pump, um, but, you know, that's a uh, less, you know, it's all important, but it's less relevant in terms of things to look for and manipulate. Okay, it also has a gas exchange membrane or a gas exchanger. This is important, right? Because as we talked about, venous, venous ECMO 
is all about respiratory failure. You need to oxygenate the blood and pull out carbon dioxide, whereas venoarterial ECMO is about respiratory failure sometimes, but is primarily about the pumping. So the pump is most important for venoarterial, whereas the you know oxygen gas exchange membrane is very important for venous venous. So this is a silicone membrane, and this is a format, um, a depiction of it. So what happens is the blood gets pumped through this membrane, and the other portion of the membrane, you're sweeping gas through it, and that gas sweeping through it is full of oxygen. So the oxygen diffuses into the blood, whereas the carbon dioxide diffuses out of the blood. Then the sweep expends, expels the carbon dioxide, and what is left is, you know, oxygenated blood. You can control how much FiO2, the fraction of oxygen that you are sweeping past the membrane. So for people who need more oxygen support, you can make, you know, this 100% oxygen. For people that need less oxygen support because you don't want them to be oxygen toxic, you know, you could set it wherever you want, 80%, 60%, etc. The FiO2 that you set controls the oxygen content, but it is the sweep speed, how fast this is sweeping through the membrane that controls the amount of carbon dioxide that comes off the blood. So if you have hypercapnia, too much carbon dioxide in the blood, you want to increase the sweep speed because that will de it'll increase the amount of carbon dioxide that it's you know sucking or diffusing out of the blood and thus decrease the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood. So increase the sweep speed if you have too much carbon dioxide, whereas you'll increase the oxygen concentration in the gas itself if you have too low of oxygen. All right, and the last thing, which is a smaller thing, is the heat exchanger. Um, this is a circuit that goes outside of the body. And you want to make sure that that blood stays warm before you return it to the body. So typically, it's set at 37 to 40 degrees Celsius, depending on the patient's temperature. Just of note, if you set it too high, um, higher temperatures actually lead to hemolysis or those lysing or that lysing of the red blood cells. All right. So then next is indications and contraindications. This is somewhat of a gray area or a challenging in area in terms of the indications. So we're going to focus on VV ECMO indications. VA ECMO indications are related to, you know, cardiac and hemodynamic failure, whereas VV ECMO indications are related to respiratory failure. People have put forth some kind of numerical, you know, um, indication numbers, but these are not, you know, not followed absolute. So there is some subjectivity to deciding who, you know, is a candidate for and should require ECMO. But in general, you can think of it this way. This is a helpful guide. Individuals who you anticipate having a high mortality, greater than 50%, their PaO2 to Fi2 ratio is less than 150 on a fractional a fraction of inspired oxygen and greater than 90%. So what does that mean? So the PaO2 to FiO2 ratio is how much O2 is in the blood compared to how much O2 you're giving the patient. So lower means that that patient is on a high amount of oxygen you're giving them with a low amount of oxygen in their blood. So lower is bad because it means they're requiring high oxygen support and still not oxygenating well in their blood. And they go to say that this is despite six hours of optimal care. So you want to make sure these patients are on, you know, appropriate ventilator settings and all that. And if even with six hours of optimal care, they still fulfill these requirements, they'd be, you know, a possible candidate for ECMO. You also can start ECMO for hypercapnic respiratory failure. Um, increased CO2 is hypercapnia. CO2 actually causes the blood to be more acidic. It causes a respiratory acidosis. So if you're acidotic and you're acidemic and your pH is less than 7.15, despite optimal care, with this hypoxia, you may be a candidate. And then age less than 65 years old. And again, these are, you know, not totally hard and fast rules. Each institution kind of has their own set of rules, but this is just somewhat of a rough qualifier to get an idea of who would be a candidate for VV ECMO. 
All right. Contraindications would be life expectancy. ECMO is invasive. There are lots of complications. If the patient, even with ECMO, does not have a possibility of recovering, then they shouldn't be started on ECMO. Again, it's not definitive therapy. It's meant as a bridge while a patient heals. And when we say heals, we mean, you know, heals over days, not months or years. Another contraindication is severe aortic regurgitation. So why would that be? Well, if we go up and some of these contraindications, so this is VV and VA ECMO. So if we go up and look at VA ECMO, veno-arterial ECMO, right, which is this right column here, you are shooting up retrograde blood flow. And we're going to scroll down to a different picture to go over that in detail. So what happens in VA ECMO, and let's zoom out a little bit so we can see a little better, is you have, as we've talked about, the femoral arteries. So this is femoral artery on one side, femoral artery on another side, and this is not a perfect drawing. Um, but what's happening is you're drawing blood out on one side, pumping it through the circuit, and then pumping it into the femoral artery on the other side. So what is happening is you actually are shooting that blood retrograde back up the aorta towards the heart. And as such, the blood perfuses, you know, all these different blood vessels and organs that come off the aorta. Now, the part of the heart that that aorta enters into is through the aortic valve, right? So we'll just kind of draw a rough drawing here. So this is the aorta, and then here is the left ventricle with the left atrium. So what we have is the mitral valve, blood throws through the mitral valve into the left ventricle, and then we have the aortic valve, and it throws out of the aortic valve into the aorta. But in ECMO, VA ECMO, you're getting a retrograde blood up into the aorta. So if you have really bad aortic regurgitation and these valves aren't working, what will happen is that you'll just get really bad retrograde blood flow into the heart and it'll meet with this forward flow and you'll get cardiac thrombus and, and essentially um, cause more heart damage than help. And that turned out to be a really sloppy drawing, but hopefully that was helpful. If that was confusing again, just ask us in the comments and we can uh, answer any specific questions or go over it again. All right. In addition to that, aortic dissection is a contraindication. Um, reason being, as we've you know kind of just alluded to, if the aorta has a dissection in it and you put a cannula going towards the aorta and shooting blood up there, it's going to cause a worsening dissection. And what an aortic dissection is, for those of you that don't know, is so here is our aorta. It's this big blood vessel. The blood vessel has these walls. And if a wall is dissected, it forms this flap. And if you have an aortic dissection, this is part of the wall that has dissected off the other part of the wall. And you're high risk for this bleeding and perforation of the aorta. And if that happens, you will die. So an aortic dissection is another contraindication. Then there's some other ones here that make intuitive sense. So an ANC less than 500. ANC is your absolute neutrophil count. These are immune cells. If you are putting foreign objects into the body, such as the cannulas that you need to for ECMO, you're high, high, high risk for infection. So if you're immunocompromised and your absolute neutrophil count is less than 500, you shouldn't be on ECMO because you're most likely going to get an infection and probably die from that infection. If you have a contraindication to anticoagulation, I could have spelled some of that out, but CI is contraindication to AC is anticoagulation. We'll get into it, but you have to be anticoagulated to be on ECMO or else you'll get blood clots everywhere. So if you can't be anticoagulated, because let's say you have a really bad GI bleed or a brain bleed or something else, you can't be put on ECMO because the anticoagulation will make that bleeding worse and you'll die from con um, uh, results of bleeding. And then last would be central nervous system damage or brain damage. It's another contraindication. All right. So let's see. So far we have gone over the general principles, venous venous versus venous arterial, how it's set up, and then the parts and machines that make up the ECMO circuit, as well as indications and contraindications. Next is maintenance. How do we maintain the ECMO circuit? So you have now decided that the patient does have an indication they didn't have contraindications, they were cannulated, meaning you placed the catheters, and they're on the ECMO circuit. What do you need to do now? 
Well, you need to monitor their venous oximetry. What's that? So we have, right, arteries and veins, as we've talked about. Oh, that didn't show up. We have arteries and veins, and the venous oximetry is the O2 concentration. I do brackets for O2 concentration in the veins. And again, it's not as simple as this, but that's a good way to think about it. And if the venous oximetry is low, you want to be careful because it is a suggestion that your ECMO circuit, you need to, you know, adjust how well it's delivering oxygen. All right. In addition to that, as we've talked about, you need to anticoagulate these patients with heparin. Heparin, right, is a uh, medication that we often use for both treatment and prevention of blood clotting. All right. It is a common medication, but the dosing you need to use in ECMO is quite high. As you can tell, patients on an ECMO circuit, and we're going to scroll up to go back here, you're pulling blood out of the body and putting it through this circuit. This is very high risk to be very prothrombotic and cause blood clots to form, right? Because anytime you're taking the blood out and putting it in a foreign material and changing how that blood is flowing, that blood often gets stasis and it will clot very, very easily. So you need to have these patients on anticoagulation with heparin constantly. They are also very high risk to bleed. So the other thing is you want to maintain their platelets above 50,000. So on the ECMO circuit, you are going to consume platelets, right? You're, you know, having small amount of lysis of red blood cells. You're having small blood clotting events. The ECMO circuit itself is going to consume platelets. And if those platelets drop too low, platelets are involved in blood clotting and you can have more bleeding events. You want to check platelets and make sure to maintain platelets above 50,000. They also, you know, some sources say maintain hemoglobin greater than 12. In our experience, this is not part of our protocol necessarily. Um, so we kind of put a question mark here, uh, but some sources will advocate to keep the hemoglobin above 12. And then the other thing is reduce your ventilator settings. These patients are often intubated on ventilators. The ECMO circuit is going to oxygenate the blood and take out carbon dioxide. So that vent the patient on doesn't have to be on huge settings. And as we know, vents can cause trauma to the lungs through pressure. It can cause trauma through the lungs through volume and cause oxygen toxicity. So reduce those ventilator settings to what we, you know, would consider minimal ventilatory support. Oh, I don't know why that didn't draw either. We'll erase that and we will place it over here. Minimal vent support. All right. Okay. And then last but not least, the complications. Lots and lots of potential complications. So as we've mentioned, a big complication is bleeding. 30 to 50% of patients on ECMO will bleed. And that's secondary to the anticoagulation, the heparin that they have to be on, as well as their thrombocytopenia or low platelets that we talked about. And, you know, our clinical experience, many, 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 many patients on ECMO bleed. Now, sometimes that's just oozing from the cannula sites that are going into the groins, into the femoral vessels. Sometimes that is more significant bleeding in the brain or the GI tract, but many of these patients have bleeding problems. Interestingly, they also have thromboembolic problems or blood clotting problems. Many of them get DVTs or deep vein thromboses, pulmonary embolisms or blood clots in the lungs. And this is because of the fact you're on the ECMO circuit, and that's a foreign body. You know, it's a foreign body. You're taking blood out of the body into this circuit, and that leads to blood clotting. A way you can monitor this is always look in the ECMO circuit itself for signs of blood clot, and that would suggest if there are signs of blood clot that that patient is most likely going to have a blood clotting event. There's a lot of neurologic complications. You can have encephalopathy or confusion. You can have strokes from, you know, the blood clotting that gets shot up into the brain and even brain death. There's cannulation-related complications as well. So cannulation is when you actually place the cannulas into the femoral artery. So we'll scroll back up to that picture. Um, this is the groin, right? And cannulation is when you're actually placing these big cannulas in the blood vessels. And they're big cannulas, you know, 23 to 29 French often, which is a big caliber cannula. And you can 
perforate the vessels you're trying to place them in, you can dissect those vessels, and you can cause ischemia as well by clotting off the lower legs. Um, so there's a lot of cannulation related uh, potential complications as well. Not necessarily specific to ECMO, but you can get heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. We actually talked about this in a previous video. We will link it in the video description. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is when your body actually forms an immune response to heparin that leads to um, some potential blood clotting events. And in this case, if it happens on ECMO, since you have to be anticoagulated with heparin being the preferred choice, you'll switch that patient to Argatraban, which is another blood thinner. A few other things. You can get pulmonary hemorrhage. This is pulmonary being lung, hemorrhage being bleeding, so hemorrhage in the lung. The reason being is you can have poor LV. LV is left ventricular emptying. So what does this mean? So think about the ECMO circuit for a second, and we'll scroll back up to the pictures. As we said, the ECMO circuit pumps a bunch of blood into the heart, and then that goes through the lungs to the left side of the heart. Well, if the left side of the heart is not working well, and you're forcefully pumping all of this blood into the lung, but then that blood in the lung is not being emptied by the left side of the heart well enough, you're going to get a bunch of venous uh, and arterial engorgement in the blood vessels in the lung, because that ECMO circuit is still pumping. Whether it's emptying well on the left side or not, you're still getting all this volume pumped into the lung. So if you're having you know, a bunch of volume, three arrows pumped into the lung, which we'll draw again here, yay lung, and then just one arrow pumped out of the lung because the left side of the heart is not working well, you're going to get all this blood that gets engorged in the lung and can lead to pulmonary hemorrhage. All right, in addition to that, you can get cardiac thrombosis. We talked about this with the retrograde flow, right? If you, the VA ECMO, you're taking blood out of the femoral artery on one side into the ECMO circuit and pumping it into the femoral artery on the other side to retrograde flow up the aorta towards the heart. And if the heart isn't pumping well, that blood can pool in the heart and lead to cardiac thrombosis or blood clot in the heart, which is obviously bad. And then you can also get coronary and cerebral hypoxia. This is an idea that is commonly called north-south syndrome, and it is Let's see, let's, we can use this drug. So the heart here with its native function is pumping blood this way, whereas the ECMO circuit is pumping blood retrograde back up to the aorta. And depending on how well the heart is working, at some point you may get pooling somewhere in here. So if the heart isn't working well, this retrograde blood that's oxygenated from the ECMO circuit can travel all the way up the aorta, go out of the vessels. These go to the body, go out of these vessels. You know, some of these vessels go to the brain and then get to the heart and perfuse the heart. But if you start to regain some native function in the heart, but the lungs aren't working and your heart is going to pump blood to, let's say, here, whereas the ECMO circuit only pumps blood to here, and this is where you kind of get the pooling, you are going to get the deoxygenated blood that the heart is pumping that is then going to travel to both the heart as well as the brain. And we can, you know, erase this here. Let's just say it travels to here as well as the brain. And you can get cerebral ischemia, north-south syndrome. The heart has regained enough function to pump some deoxygenated blood to then mix with the ECMO blood. And some of that deoxygenated blood then goes to the coronary and cerebral circulation. They, we say sample blood from the right upper extremity to figure this out because this blood vessel closest to the heart is going to go to the right upper extremity. And if this right upper extremity shows that this blood is deoxygenated, an implication that it's coming from blood from the heart rather than from the ECMO circuit and that you could be getting hypoxia that's in the coronary cerebral circulation. Another confusing topic and one that we'll probably do a separate video on in general, north-south syndrome. So that is all we had for kind of our introduction to ECMO. Um, 
tremendously complex, tremendously interesting though, and we think we'll probably make a number of kind of small spin-off videos going into more detail on each one of these things in the future. So thanks for checking out the video. We hope it was helpful and informative. Let us know what thoughts, comments, questions you have down below. If you enjoyed the video, give us a like. We have, let's see, we've been doing a ton of COVID-19 videos lately, but we do have some, you know, general medical videos out there on hepatitis thrombocytopenia. We did a video on intraortic balloon pumps that has uh, gained uh, quite a bit of following. So we'll link some of that in this video's description. Check those out and check our page out. We'll hopefully be getting back to more general medical education content um, with the, you know, optimistic view that the COVID-19 pandemic will hopefully be improving and eventually be, you know, resolved and we can get back to general medical education content. But in any case, give us a subscribe, hit that bell button to get notifications when new videos come out. We enjoy having you. Thank you for checking out the video. Stay well, keep learning, and we will see you all next time.